you so much, Ahmed. It is a great pleasure for me to be here today, and uh, I thank you guys so much. It's it's very inspiring to be able to stand in front of a group of patients and their families and talk about the advances that have been made in the treatment of melanoma. And um, I think that uh, Jeff Weber put it very well that the biggest reward in our work is to be able to meet people who are long-term survivors or people who have actually been cured of their disease. <clears throat> Um, there's a lot of work yet to be done, so I'm uh, very happy that this is work that I can continue. So what I'll be talking to you about today is uh, the art and science of combination therapy in melanoma. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose, and our learning objectives today include the basic principles of targeted and immune therapy in melanoma, much of which you've already heard about this morning and then review some of the preclinical data on targeted therapies and their effect on the immune recognition of cancer, and then evaluate clinical trial data on combination therapy and future strategies. So melanoma therapy is an evolving art, and the analogy that I've drawn here, uh, pun intended, is to talk about how melanoma treatment is in itself an art form. So I don't know how many of you are avid followers of the New York Times, but uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee, who was the author of The Emperor of All Maladies, recently contributed an article called The Improvisational Oncologist. And in this article, he talks about how cancer treatment has evolved so much in the last few years that we're no longer thinking about standard cookie-cutter approaches to the treatment of cancer. It used to be you had a diagnosis, you were given a chemotherapy, and once your cancer progressed, you were given a next line of chemotherapy. Not so much now. We're learning more and more through genomics and personalized medicine that everyone's cancer is as individual as their own fingerprint, and therefore the treatment options that you lay out for that patient and how you approach the chess game, as it was alluded to earlier today, is actually very individualized. So if we consider early art being cave drawings in the Paleolithic period, this is a very simplistic rendering of how people chose to express themselves. And then later, many years later, as the Renaissance emerged between the 14th and the 17th centuries, we saw that art took on new and more nuanced and certainly more elegant forms. And the corollary that I would draw between targeted therapy and immunotherapy is with sculpture and with painting. So you can see uh, Bernini's Daniel and the Lion, the sculpture in the bottom here. And this is the analogy I would use for targeted therapy because you are using something to create an almost immediate change on a very solid object. And the change can be very long lasting. Whereas with immunotherapy, this is almost more of a painting as an art form. So this is carefully applied. There's a lot of layer. There's a lot of nuance, time that's invested to evoke change. However, you can still get very beautiful and dramatic results, which you've already heard about today in talking about what we've seen with immunotherapy in this field. The reason that I want to consider this talk as something about mixed media is because when you take painting and you combine it with a solid art form, you can actually still get a very beautiful result, as you can see here in uh, Klimt's Water Snakes, which is an oil on canvas, but also with gold flake overlay. So this is a combination of two art forms that has emerged as something even more elegant. So if we consider, again, the analogy that can be drawn between targeted therapy and immunotherapy, High-dose interleukin-2, which you heard about earlier today, was really what fostered our interest in using immunotherapy as a target, uh, as a strategy for melanoma. Objective responses were there, but a little bit low from what we consider today. And uh, I hope, I know that this is being recorded, but I hope it does not get back to Michael Atkins that I said, it's so easy, a caveman can do it. But, <laughs> uh, but certainly, uh, this is kind of the beginning. This is the beginning of our art form in terms of how we thought about cancer therapy. If you jump ahead to about uh, 10 to 15, even 20 years later, 
now with checkpoint inhibition and immunotherapy, we've seen that the objective responses have doubled or tripled in most cases with ipilimumab, nivolumab, and pembrolizumab. And then with targeted therapies, we've seen even better objective response rates. And again, this is where you get that immediate lasting impact uh, on a tumor, on melanoma in particular, and objective responses, 50% of patients or more. And then now with the emergence of combination therapy, we're seeing objective responses beyond 60%. So we are getting closer. We are moving the mark closer to a cure. So you've already heard this morning a lot about the basic principles of targeted therapy and immune therapy in melanoma, so I won't spend too much time on this. But as was mentioned earlier today, BRAF is an important therapeutic target in melanoma. We know that in uh, skin without chronic sun damage, it's present in about 50% of those patients. In patients with chronic sun damage, it's about 10%. So we know that it's an important marker in terms of our approach to how melanoma patients should be treated. We also know that BRAF is an important protein for melanoma progression. So if you consider what happens between a benign nevus, meaning a mole that doesn't really need to be paid attention to, to something that becomes a more aggressive tumor and then unfortunately eventually metastatic disease, BRAF mutation is actually the key mutation that happens first. And it's responsible for what we consider the vertical growth phase, which essentially allows the tumor cells to go through the epidermis and down into the deeper layers of the skin. We also know later that as part of a second hit in melanoma, there are loss of two critical genes that are responsible for tumor suppression, and those are CDKN2A uh, and P10, <clears throat> excuse me, and the loss of those actually is what it not enables melanoma to continue to grow and then enter the bloodstream and form distant metastases. When we learned that BRAF was a therapeutic target, and Dr. Weber explained this earlier today, when you target it at, at its baseline, as you can see here in malignant melanoma, and this is uh, elegant work by Dr. Tony Rebus, who is also a leader in the field, prior to the uh, BRAF inhibition, as you can see here, there's a lot of melanoma cells that are in this tissue sample. KI67 is essentially our marker to tell us how aggressively a tumor might be growing. And when you block BRAF with drugs like bemorafenib and dibrafenib, you can see a very dramatic and almost immediate response within a couple weeks of therapy. So as you can see, the melanoma cells here have rapidly died. The KI67, which was bright prior to therapy, has now nearly completely been eradicated. And as was shown earlier today, when compared to chemotherapy, targeting BRAF with a drug like bemorafenib had a clear survival benefit for those patients. We also saw that in patients themselves with a high tumor burden, within a short period of time, there's a significant change in the number of tumors that are seen. However, we also learned that eventually the tumor would outsmart this therapy. And as you can see here, in a patient who initially responded to anti-BRAF treatment, unfortunately some weeks later relapsed, and this is what fostered our interest in trying to figure out what additional blockades can be put in place. So then when we looked at the combination of BRAF targeting and MEK targeting, which is a downstream uh, upregulation that can take place in the setting of BRAF inhibition, as Dr. Weber showed earlier today, the combination of drugs targeting BRAF and MEK was far superior to targeting BRAF alone. So then the other option, the other treatment arm that we often think of is harnessing the immune system. And this is a graphic that a lot of people are probably familiar with. We know now that cancer has a lot of ways to outsmart uh, being detected and being killed. Avoiding immune destruction is obviously one of them. In 2015, OSC ASCO called immunotherapy the cancer advance of the year. And in the lay press, the discovery of immune checkpoint inhibitors and the effect that they can have on cancer was actually referred to as our penicillin moment. So this is really where we had a paradigm shift in our ability to treat cancer and continues to shift 
And while melanoma has been a sort of the gold standard in establishing this science, we've learned that many other patients are now benefiting from what we've learned in melanoma. Women with triple negative breast cancer, bladder cancer, colon cancer, et cetera. And those discoveries only continue to grow. I uh, had remarked to Dr. Hamid that at our upcoming ASCO annual meeting, there are a couple of special sessions on immunotherapy, and they were sold out two months in advance, which really speaks to how popular this has become with a lot of people who are involved in patient care and, and certainly in oncology. I would wager that if there was ever a biopic made about immunotherapists, that movie would be called Revenge of the Nerds. <laughs> and I, as a proud card-carrying member of that club, I am thrilled to see that so many people are interested in this science. So we've already heard a little bit about what some of those critical immune checkpoints are, the brakes in the car that are being released. And as you can see here, ipilimumab, which targets the CTLA-4 pathway, and tezolizumab and duvalumab, which act against PDL1, and nivolumab and pembrolizumab, pardon me, um, <clears throat> which target uh, PD1, have all been critical to our success in t treating patients with solid tumor malignancies and now even in hematologic malignancies. These responses can be very dramatic. Uh, again, work from Tony Rebus. This is a patient prior to receiving ipilimumab. And then after ipilimumab, as you can see on this <clears throat> PET scan, there has been a dramatic anti-tumor response. And this is really what fostered a lot of the ongoing work that's happening today. Just a little bit about some of the data that's been covered already. Uh, when they looked at ipilimumab versus GP100, which is a vaccine that's engineered against a particular protein that melanoma expresses, there was a huge difference in the disease-free survival in patients that got ipilimumab, uh, but we did start to notice early on that there were some toxicities in those patients that were treated with this drug. Later, when we looked at anti-PD-1 versus anti-CTLA-4, and this has also already been covered today, pembrolizumab had a uh, far superior response rate in terms of their progression-free survival, also their overall survival, and this is a medication that was better tolerated and is better tolerated uh, in terms of side effects. When we looked at nivolumab versus investigator choice chemotherapy, this is Dr. Weber's paper, paper from Lancet in 2015. Uh, this is what we call a forest plot, and this is what oncologists kind of use to help us guide which therapy would be better for a patient based on a variety of factors. And what we found is that nivolumab bested chemotherapy in every single regard. So this is what favors nivolumab versus investigator choice chemotherapy. Um, it's gratifying to be able to tell patients with melanoma now that chemotherapy is not even something we would consider because we have so many uh, far superior treatments that are available. And we can see that patients, regardless of their BRAF status and regardless of whether they had benefited previously from ipilimumab, did better when they got nivolumab versus chemotherapy. So as I mentioned before, our art continues to evolve. We are getting better at what we do. With anti-PD-1 therapies, we're seeing high objective response rates, um, even with atezolizumab, which is an anti-PD-L1. And this is old data. I'll show you some updated data in a moment. But as you can see, the one-year overall survival, meaning how many of those patients were still alive at one year, was very high with anti-PD-1 therapy. And if you consider five years ago, the median overall survival for patients with metastatic melanoma was six to eight months with therapy, and we're now seeing people that are living far beyond that. It is a testament truly to standing on the shoulders of giants and how much science is done to change patients' lives. But more importantly, also alter the conversation that we have with those we care for. So this was also discussed earlier today. We did see that nivolumab and ipilimumab, when used together, did have a superior progression-free survival. And also importantly, we saw that in patients with pd one positive tumors, these patients 
had about the same in terms of their, or almost exactly the same in terms of their median progression-free survival. And looking at PDL1 as a predictor of response has become and will continue be, to be important in terms of deciding who should get what therapy. What's interesting is that there's this jump between 5.3 months in PDL1 negative tumors and 11 months in those that were receiving ipilimumab, which kind of makes you wonder if ipilimumab, the anti-CTLA-4, is an immune primer. Is it something that's ringing the dinner bell for those hungry T cells so that they can breach uh, the wall and get to the enemy, which in this case is melanoma? We do know, however, that with that benefit, there is going to be some opportunity cost, and the toxicity was not something to be disregarded. Uh, we saw quite a bit of toxicity in the combination with those drugs. And this is also kind of where some of that art needs to come back in, in terms of appropriate patient selection, management of side effects, but also determining maybe ahead of time, is there some signature, is there some sign that the patient may have that would tell us when and how they would benefit from dual therapy treatment. Just a little bit about anti-PDL1, atezolizumab, which we'll revisit later in this talk, um, did show an objective response rate of 26%, so pretty close to what we've seen with nivolumab and pembrolizumab as single agents. And again, compared to ipilimumab, much better tolerated, so there was a lower incidence of grade 3, 4 AEs, which implies then that patients could probably tolerate these as single agents and not have that opportunity cost that I mentioned before. Probably most importantly, and what's most exciting about our work, is seeing how these patients are living long after they've gotten treatment with immune-stimulating agents. And if you think about it, the principle makes a lot of sense. We're trying to train the immune system to recognize melanoma and kill it, much that we would like using a vaccine. So when you are vaccinated against streptococcus, then theoretically your immune system should take care of you for at least five years. And we're actually seeing that in patients that have been primed to recognize melanoma and keep it at bay. So long-term survivals have been seen in ipilimumab and with other checkpoint inhibitors. As Dr. Weber indicated before, we are seeing what's called a tail on the curve. So in prior, prior studies before we had immune therapy, normally when you would look at survival curves for different drugs, this would eventually come down to zero, meaning we knew that eventually patients would progress and die of their disease. Not so much now with these immune therapy drugs that we're seeing, and a good proportion of patients are actually living well beyond what we would have even anticipated. <coughs> this recently got a lot of press um, after our annual cancer meeting in New Orleans in 2016. Uh, the data had just been released with nivolumab that a third of patients were alive at year five, which was an extraordinary advancement to be shared with the melanoma community, but moreover with oncologists at large, to know that this is the type of hope that we can give to patients. And I'll tell you a brief anecdote. Um, there's a, a young woman I'm taking care of right now. Uh, she's 38 years old, has a stage four uh, metastatic melanoma, it's BRAF mutant. She got about a seven month response from interleukin two, uh, had gotten oral therapy as well and unfortunately progressed. And um, I saw her shortly after her 39th birthday. And we were talking about switching her over to nivolumab or pembrolizumab as a single agent. And her question to me was, um, is there any chance that we could postpone my therapy because I don't know if I'm going to make it to my 40th? And to be able to say to her, well, actually, I have every reason to believe that you will and live beyond 40 uh, was an extraordinary thing to be able to say to her. And in fact, just a few months ago, she had gotten back from being in Chicago with her daughter for her 40th birthday. So it's, um, it's really gratifying to be able to have these conversations with patients now. So we've seen long-term survival not only with ipilimumab and nivolumab, but also with pembrolizumab. This was just published in JAMA uh, last month. And as you can see, these survival curves 
indicate that patients are getting beneficial long-term responses with checkpoint inhibitor therapy. So then the question becomes, is there something that we can do to combine treatments so that we can get an even better response? Um, there was a patient that I saw in clinic on Wednesday. He's a 60-year-old gentleman with um, stage 4 BRAF-positive melanoma and had been on uh, BRAF and MEK inhibitor therapy for the better part of 18 months, and his scans showed that he had stable disease. He had initially had widespread metastatic disease, a lot of abdominal pain from growths in his abdomen and his liver, uh, had a very, very nice response to therapy, and on his repeat scans had maybe a few tumors that were about a centimeter, a centimeter and a half in size, but hadn't really changed over a period of months. And he said, you know, could we consider putting me on immunotherapy at this point. And I said, yes, yeah, certainly, you know, we, we could. We could talk about that. He said, well, could we put me on all three? And I said, well, <laughs> I said, I'm giving a talk in L.A. on Saturday, so you should just come along with me, and then you could ask that question in the audience. Um, so we know that with targeted therapy, you can get a very dramatic, what we call an induction of anti-tumor response. You can get significant tumor shrinkage by using targeted treatments. With using immune therapy, it's not quite as dramatic, but it can be long-lasting. So then the question is, can we combine those two together somehow and get not only that initial anti-tumor effect, but also something that can last for a very long time? So what I'll share with you now is a little bit of some of the preclinical data that we've seen and then talk about what the trials have showed. So we know that timing is everything. So as a couple of people have mentioned earlier today, uh, melanoma, unfortunately, is a very clever tumor, so it knows how to hide itself from the immune system. The uh, analogy that I often discuss with patients or use with patients is talking about a golf ball hiding in the grass, and I'm from Florida, so everyone gets a golf joke. Um, so melanoma can surround itself with what we call an immune suppressive microenvironment. And we're learning more and more about this now, how golf balls can essentially pull grass around themselves and remain hidden and make it so that T cells cannot get in and, and, and effectively kill the tumor. We know that with the induction of targeted therapy that you can affect some changes in the microenvironment that allow the immune system to get in and do its job. Then the question becomes, if you apply checkpoint inhibition, can you train those cells to stick around and effectively eradicate melanoma so that if it tries to regrow at some point, the immune system can take care of it? So a few things about BRAF and immunity. We know that BRAF mutant melanoma may be, pardon me, less responsive to checkpoint inhibition. Uh, there was one paper that showed that patients who got nivolumab who were BRAF mutant actually had a slightly lower objective response rate versus those that were BRAF wild type, which is kind of counterintuitive because we heard earlier today that highly mutagenic tumors should be responsive to checkpoint inhibition. But we've also learned that by treating melanoma with BRAF in inhibition, you can actually improve the immune recognition of those tumors. So by killing melanoma cells, you get antigen release, and this is essentially a way to prime the immune system to recognize melanoma and kill it. And then we also see an increase in what we call TILs, or tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and CD8 T cells. So if you guys remember from your basic immunology, there are two subsets of T cells that we focus on the most. There's CD4, which is a memory cell that can be uh, devastated by AIDS and HIV. And then there's CD8, which is cytotoxic. So these are essentially the SWAT team that rushes in and does the effective uh, anti-tumor killing. So when we look at melanoma cells uh, under the microscope and we look at how BRAF inhibition can affect changes in the tumor itself, when you look at um, MART1, which is a stain for a particular melanoma antigen, Prior to treatment with a BRAF inhibitor, you can see that there's some cells that are staining with it, but not, not as many as one would expect. However, after you treat those cells with a BRAF inhibitor, as you can see here, there's a lot more stain that's being showed. So by inducing cell death, by killing those melanoma cells, you're increasing the amount of antigen expression 
which is important for the immune system to be able to recognize. Um, and as you can see here under fluorescence uh, photographs, again, the MART1, the melanoma antigen, increases dramatically after patients have been, excuse me, after those cells have been exposed to a BRAF inhibitor. We also see that the CD8 cells, the cytotoxic T cells in melanoma will uh, increase once you've applied a BRAF inhibitor to those uh, cell lines. So this is your CD8 stain here. As you can see, there's a few. So some of those SWAT team members are trying to get to the tumor. But when you apply a BRAF inhibitor, you can see there's an influx, a dramatic influx of the CD8 cells. And we know that this is important because if you're going to give a patient a checkpoint inhibitor like nivolumab or pembrolizumab, if you're ringing a dinner bell, you want to make sure there are people that are waiting at the table. And that's essentially the theory behind why we need those CD8 cells there. What is also interesting is the CD8 and CD4 lymphocytes will change over time. And while we know that patients who are on BRAF inhibitors will have that initial response and eventually relapse, it's not just because the melanoma is clever enough to figure out other ways to grow after those pathways have been blocked. That also has something to do with the immune cells that are in the microenvironment. So as you can see here, looking at um, CD8 cells prior to treatment, when uh, this is, these are biopsy specimens taken from a patient who was on a BRAF inhibitor. Uh, three to 15 days after they were given the drug, you can see the CD8 cells increase markedly. And then unfortunately, when that patient progresses, those CD8 cells go away. More importantly, we start to see that some of the CD4 cells, which actually can have a deleterious effect on patients with melanoma, start to reemerge. So it's not just that the melanoma is figuring out ways to regrow, but it's that the immune system is actually being changed by the BRAF inhibitor itself. And we also know that this correlates with tumor response in patients. So uh, in vitro studies and then patient studies have showed us that BRAF inhibitors don't compromise immune cell function itself. Uh, it can increase the immune recognition of melanoma cells by the mechanisms which I've already explained, and that there are other changes that take place over time. The other important change that happens with BRAF inhibition is PDL1 expression. So as I mentioned before, there's a dual strategy here. We're not just trying to kill melanoma itself, but we're also trying to get the immune system to come in and do the cleanup job and recognize melanoma so that you can maintain that immunity against it. And when you look at the changes in PDL1 expression, which is very important for immune checkpoint inhibitors to work, prior to treatment with the BRAF inhibitor, you can see the PDL1 expression is kind of scant. However, when you treat them with a BRAF inhibitor, that PDL1 uh, goes up dramatically. And this, again, is a very important concept to apply to when you give patients medications like ipilimumab, nivolumab, and pembrolizumab, because you want to make sure those drugs will work. You want to make sure that they will respond appropriately and improving the odds as much as possible. What we also found is that when you have patients who progress uh, after being treated with a BRAF inhibitor, that uh, the changes that I had mentioned earlier about antigen expression in the presence of these CD8 T cells at progression can actually be regained when you use a MEK inhibitor drug. So doing that downstream targeting of MEK can actually help you get a more robust anti-tumor response from an immune standpoint. And again, looking at CD8 cells prior to treatment, then with BRAF inhibition, at progression, those CD8 cells go away. And they are called back into the microenvironment when you target those uh, melanoma cells with a MEK inhibitor. So this will become important later when we talk about what triple therapy could potentially mean. So we can see that PDL1 expression and the CD8 T cells in vitro will uh, increase when those two drugs together are being used. This is data that was published in 2012 and 2015, 
And when we look at PDL1 expression in the tumor, uh, you can see that the uh, dibrafenib, the BRAF agent by itself, uh, can induce some PDL1 expression, but that is maintained when you have BRAF and MEK inhibition together. Interestingly, you can still get some effect from MEK inhibition, but as Dr. Weber alluded to earlier, MEK inhibition by itself actually seems to work against the immune system. So there's, a, there's certainly an art to this in terms of how and when these drugs are applied. And this is just an example here of showing how MEK inhibition can impair T cell function. Um, when you apply a uh, MEK inhibitor uh, to the cell, pardon me, to cell cultures, so this is a cell count of CD8 cells in a patient with uh, melanoma. When you use a um, MEK inhibitor, which is seen here, the cell count actually goes down. So as a single agent, this appears to be not helpful in terms of making that a more rich immune environment. However, when combined together, it didn't appear to have any uh, impact on activated T cells in vitro. So again, this is a selective approach in terms of how should we combine these drugs and when and which ones are going to have the most impact on the immune infiltrate. When they looked at this combination in mice, they saw that mice treated with BRAF inhibition with or without MEK inhibition together actually had an increased T cell activation and anti-tumor effect. So looking at this slide here, uh, these are, this is essentially a, a mouse PET scan, which I imagine is probably the size of a toilet paper tube. Um, <laughs> so when you combine uh, trametinib, which is a MEK inhibitor with a a vehicle delivery system, uh, you can see that you're getting some, some uptake of, uh, the, um, of the radioactive isotope in mice. However, that can actually be enhanced when you combine the two together. And in fact, when you look at this slide, uh, pardon me, when you look at this graph below here, looking at tumor size, um, you can get a dramatic uh, decrease in the size of those tumors when you combine those two drugs together. And this is something that we already know about based on the trials that were shown earlier. So this is kind of where the question of switch therapy comes in. So if we use anti-BRAF drugs to increase the number of CD8 T cells, but also increase antigen expression by melanoma and increase pdl one expression, if we do them together, will we get a more robust anti-tumor response? Will we get more CD8 T cells? And not only is it efficacious, but is it safe and is it tolerable? And this is where Dr. Weber had mentioned earlier that phase one trials can be very important in helping us discover what's going to be the best recipe for patients in terms of giving them a clinical benefit, but also keeping them out of the hospital. So we know that using anti-PD-1 therapy and BRAF inhibition, that you can get a synergistic effect in the number and function of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. So this is data that was published just a couple of years ago. When you look at BRAF inhibition with CD8 cells and then BRAF inhibition plus an anti-PD-1, there's a dramatic increase in the number of CD8 cells, which is what we want to see. This is what's going to enable your immune system to recognize melanoma and keep it at bay. Uh, more importantly, when we look at FOXP3s, which are cells that are immune suppressive, they're going to make it so that drugs like nivolumab and pembrolizumab don't work, uh, that when you use BRAF inhibition or BRAF inhibition plus anti-PD-1, that the, it's hard to see here, but that the number of uh, POC, Fox, pardon me, Fox P3s that are present uh, remains essentially the same. And there were a couple of early papers that suggested that combining targeted therapy with immunotherapy was going to be wildly successful. So looking at uh, immunotherapy with BRAF and MEK inhibitors, um, we did see that it, in a couple of cases it actually induced complete tumor regression. It in increased T cell infiltration and improved in vivo cytotoxicity. And we also th found that single agent BRAF inhibition, while it can increase TAMs and Tregs, which can have an immune suppressive effect, when you add a MEK inhibitor like trametinib, 
that it can actually be diminished. So combination therapy coupled with immunotherapy seems like a very rational choice in terms of improving that immune-rich environment. We also found that triple therapy increases melanoma antigen expression and that the combination of dibrafenib, trametinib, and anti-PD-1 therapy in melanoma tumors showed a superior anti-tumor effect. And as you can see here, combined BRAF inhibition with anti-CTLA-4, or ipilimumab, can also lead to prolonged anti-tumor immu immunity in a patient with metastatic melanoma. So this is a paper that was published in Cancer Immunology Research in 2014. And this is actually very instructional because it talks about when and how these drugs should be applied. So if you look here, this is, again, your CD8 infiltrate. This is prior to treatment. And then you start adding your BRAF inhibition here. So your CD8 cells increase. Then you start to add anti-CTLA-4. And while you see this initial change in the CD8 cells here, the cells start to come back in. So combination treatment can have a significant impact on the presence of those immune cells. More importantly, with continued treatment, and it's kind of hard to see here, but this is at day 132, this is many, many months later, you have those CD8 cells present. So they've showed up, they've killed the melanoma, and they've maintained their anti-tumor response many months later. So very briefly, in the last few minutes, we'll talk a little bit about the clinical trial data that has currently uh, become available. Um, and there have been a number of combination strategies that have been explored. Uh, as you can see here, there have been four to date so far that have looked at different combination treatments. And the first one that looked at ipilimumab plus vemurafenib, uh, unfortunately, uh, had to be terminated because there were significant toxic side effects that were seen. Um, the most notable ones were in patients that had hepatitis and very severe hepatitis, unfortunately, that happened within a few weeks of getting ipilimumab. Um, for us as oncologists, anytime we see something that's grade three, that's bad. That means hospitalization. So we want to avoid that if we possibly can. And uh, this is from Dr. Tony Rebus that was published in the New England Journal. And again, this was mentioned earlier today, but there were significant toxicities that were seen within a few weeks of getting uh, ipilimumab when they were being treated with uh, vemurafenib. So then they looked at sequential dosing, thinking, okay, if we don't, if we try to do it stepwise, is that going to improve things from a toxicity standpoint? And unfortunately, that combination still proved to be very toxic. So ipilimumab and BRAF inhibition had quite a few grade three, four adverse events, and uh, most of those were skin related, but we also saw still quite a bit of hepatitis. Um, and the, the question sort of becomes, well, why, why might this be the case? And the thought is, is that when you uh, are inhibiting BRAF, because you're ringing the dinner bell, because you're trying to get as many T cells in as you possibly can, by releasing the breaks, giving them a medication like ipilimumab, you're probably overactivating those immune cells too much, and that's why these toxicities are seen. And then when we looked at ipilimumab plus trametinib plus gibrafenib, this, unfortunately, was an even more toxic side effect. So there are a couple of examples that were outlined here uh, in one of our uh, melanoma journals. There was a 67-year-old female that had perforation of her colon two weeks after her first dose of ipilimumab, and she needed a two-month taper of steroids. And then a 45-year-old female who, two weeks after her second dose of ipilimumab, had some diarrhea that improved with steroid treatment, but then unfortunately relapsed about 10 days later. Despite being on high-dose steroids, she had diffuse colitis with bowel perforation and required an emergent ileocolectomy. Those of us in the field that have thought about the toxicities from those drugs have uh, advanced the theory that by using MEK inhibition in particular, you're getting a downstream uh, MAP kinase activation in T cells, and so it's actually those supercharged T cells that seem to be driving this process. 
So we've also advanced a couple of theories that perhaps MEK inhibition can also have an important role in tight junction formation in the colon. So this is essentially what maintains the fabric of the large intestine. Um, and that MAP, in, MAP kinase inhibition may decrease immunosuppressive cytokines. So by targeting these with uh, MEK inhibition that you can actually worsen the toxicity of some of these drugs. So then when we looked at an anti pdl one drug with trametinib and dibrafenib, um, they looked at actually dose escalation cohorts um, using different doses of BRAF inhibition uh, with a MEK inhib inhibitor, uh, and then looking at sequential therapy. And what they saw is that there were still some dose-limiting toxicities in combination, uh, but the uh, combination did prove to be a little bit safer. There were still quite a few drug-related adverse events, including fever and fatigue, uh, diarrhea in about a third of patients, and rash in about a quarter, and then vomiting, which is something that we can see with MEK inhibitors. However, we did see that there was a very high objective response rate, and in fact, saw complete responders in a number of the patients that were seen. So encouraging data clinically, but certainly something that should be interpreted with caution in terms of the safety of these combos. Uh, this is data that Dr. Hamid presented at our Society for Melanoma Congress back in November, looking at the combination of vemurafenib plus Medi 4736. And after a dosing strategy was achieved, as you can see, the objective response rate here was uh, almost an unprecedented high of 76%, which is some of the best that we've seen, albeit in a small number of patients, encouraging data in terms of how we can dose these effectively and achieve meaningful clinical results. There are a number of combination trials that are being examined now in terms of whether to do checkpoint followed by targeted versus targeted followed by checkpoint. And then the combination, which Dr. Weber alluded to earlier today, which is the Keynote 022 trial, which will be discussed at ASCO this year. So there are a lot of unanswered questions in terms of how should we do this safely and which approaches should we take. And Acknowledging that anti-CTLA-4 ipilimumab may not be safe in combination, anti-PD-1 and anti-PDL-1 certainly may be. There's still a lot of work to be done in terms of the predictive markers, how these trials should be designed, and whether we should look at novel delivery systems to enhance immune recognition of melanoma. So this is something that is continuing as an art form for us. Certainly, we've been able to achieve some beautiful and meaningful results. And as Sir Francis Bacon said it, uh, arts and sciences should be like mines, where the noise of new works and further advances and is heard on every side. And this is certainly a tribute to the significant science that has been advanced in our field. I would like to thank you for your attention and special uh, appreciation to Dr. Jeffrey Weber, who has been an amazing mentor to me. And then, of course, to Dr. Hamed, who I look forward to enjoying a long and productive friendship and working relationship with. But most of all, thank you to your, to your families and to all of you who, as patients, have participated in clinical trials. None of this work would have been possible without you. And then, of course, thanks to many organizations that continue to support us and you in a burgeoning science. Thank you so much.